right, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Welcome to the Douglasville class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and his eternal purpose operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Douglasville branch was established in 2014. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to school officials. The president is Dr. Jamie O'Dyer, and the vice president is Dr. Dotson Wallace. In this school, we use the true, correct, original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title that the creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in the good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters in their alphabet that were produced a sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of our Heavenly Father in his son's name. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized on our chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of the chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having a shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we could ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of his name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. We call it the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court that goes around about. These three compartments, make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof out that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the threefold structure and function of the tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional aims and objectives of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, 
to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures compared to religion, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10th, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. At this time, we'll have class dedicated in prayer by Dr. Iris Jones. Then we'll have our scripture lesson read, Isaiah, the 61st, chap 61st chapter by Dr. Carol Dye. May we have our prayer. Good evening, class. Good evening. And once again, as Yahshua the Messiah has graced us with another opportunity to come together to learn more of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan, we do want to thank him always for all the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. We ask that he cause us to be focused on what he has prepared for us this evening, that we may use it so that we can see him more clearly and his purpose that he has set forth. We ask this blessing and every blessing in the name of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening. Good evening. Our scripture reading will be Isaiah, the 61st chapter. I will be reading from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authority and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trainer, the Scripture Research Association. Isaiah, the 61st chapter, begins on page 866. The spirit of Yah, Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim Yahweh's year of relief and the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old ways. They shall rise up the former desolation, and they shall repair the waste city, the desolations of many generations. The strangers shall stand out and feed their flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but ye shall be named the priests of Yahweh. Men shall call you the ministers of our Elohim. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and to their glory shall ye succeed. For your shame ye shall have double, and for your confusion, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For our Yahweh loved judgment. 
I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they the seed which Yahweh hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall be joyful in my Elohim, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom, decketh himself as a priest, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so Yah Yahweh will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. I just read to you Isaiah the 61st chapter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Thank everyone for joining us. And again, we have our visiting brethren from the Art Cork, New York class, Dr. Bonnie Schneider in class. So we thank you guys and welcome you in the bonds of peace. And also today's scripture readers will be Dr. Dotson Wallace and Dr. Carol Dye. For our first speaker, it's an honor and a pleasure to call on Dr. Justin Snyder. Good evening, class. Good evening. Happy and glad to be here. Let me just uh, transport myself to a little quieter area. Um, it is a, it's a true um, blessing to have uh, anything to say about our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, the Word of Son, and Yahshua Messiah. And we wouldn't know anything if, um, if a man hadn't received a divine vision and revelation from Yahweh El him, himself in the year 1931. Um, that's really what sets the school apart. But he delivered a teaching unto us. And um, this teaching uh, strengthens us and assures us of the truth. And... Um, it's with, um, you know, with confidence that we can go forth and try to spread this good news, which is the gospel. Why don't we get um, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1, please? 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. Okay, so th this gospel is something that you can receive. And he's saying that in wherein you stand, you can stand firm in this gospel. You can be assured of the truth of Yahshua. And he's going to go on and go ahead and read. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, he's saying here, this is Paul's writings, he's saying that you can be saved in the, in the gospel. If, it's a big one, what we call big little word, you see, if you keep in memory, read. What I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Then you for just don't want, to, you don't want to take these things for naught, you see, or believe them in vain, or make them worthless. It's not just, um, you know, <clears throat> He would talk about how that it isn't a, a Bible quote and a scripture quote and um, or Bible reading scripture quoting contest. And it's not a contest on how many correlations you can run either. But you do want to keep these things in memory. Um, the, the simplicity of the gospel has the ability to change your mind about the way that you thought about the creator. Because all of us, I don't care where you came from came in with our own thoughts, theories, concepts, and opinions of how he, how the creator existed. You see how maybe we called him God, how God existed. Um, but what we find out is that we all came in really on the same page, which was ignorant. <laughs> and um, 
you need to have those things cleaned up. And really, that is the true, uh, all the baptisms that were all done through the Law and the Prophecy is an example, you see. Those were done to show you that you could be cleaned up on the inside, because that's really where, where man fell in the, uh, from the, the get-go. You see, it talks about when he touched of that fruit in the garden, you see, or he ate of that lie, you see, he died in his conscience instantaneously and mankind inherited that death and see that's where Yahshua the Messiah picked us right up and the 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 operation you see here of um the operation of Yahweh's salvation or Yahshua is this is how he has delivered this unto us by the preaching of the gospel it, it um it's the power unto salvation okay read for I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received. You see, he delivered it just the way he received it. Read. How that Yahshua died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now that and is vitally important to understand what Paul's talking about there. How, first of all, is, a, is a, also one of them big little words. There's a lot wrapped up in there, including... By what power, by what name, you see, to what extent. There's a whole lot wrapped up into that how, you see, and how he did it according or in agreement to the scriptures, you see. And we didn't, you know, the world is ignorant of this, and, and we were too coming down here, you see, of how that the law and the prophets or those scriptures were written of Yahshua, you see. We thought maybe they were good bedtime stories or whatever we thought, you see. Um, but you see, he, even the Messiah says, search the scriptures for in them, you think ye have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. You see, that's John five thirty nine. Okay. Keep reading there. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, so that's the gospel of Yahshua, how that he died. He was buried and he resurrected the third day according to the scriptures in perfect agreement to that, you see. And that is, <laughs> it is just such a blessing to recognize that that's what your Bible, that's how your Bible is put together. It starts to just, once you see that light, you see, once Yahshua shines that light of illumination in your mind, then you can start to run the race. <laughs> then you can start to, see how this thing is put together you can go right down through and you know go right starting right at moses you see in his writings and the law you can understand what was going on in the garden how that there was a principle of a death when when um adam takes that free fruit and while eve takes the fruit and gives to her husband adam and he willingly dies for his bride there you see and so that death passed on all mankind. And, um, and then, see, they're buried in, in that work or in that condemnation, you see. And by the sweat of their face, you see, so you got that principle of water there, too. That's, that's coming right off of the, um, the chart there. If you want to zoom in on Adam, we can kind of get it. If you go down to that court roundabout portion there, you're going to see there's a tombstone there and on there is Genesis five and five. And it talks about that all the days of Adam's life were 930 years and he died. You see, cause Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim in the garden tells him that in the day that thou shall eat, you shall surely die. So in his mind, his conscience felt he falls. You see, he dies instantaneously, but it, his flesh carries on for 930 years or 70 years short of one day with Yahweh. You see, so, Either way, Yahweh can't lie. <laughs> so you got that on there. And then and you can pick up the principle with a thousand years is one day. And one day with a thousand years is uh, 2 Peter 3 and 8 on there. So um, <clears throat> so you got that death principle, you see. Or blood, too. There's a principle of blood because that um, blood is or death is, is synonymous here. And that death passes through the four corners of the earth as it were or covers the whole earth so that's your four points of blood all right so then you got your your burial there in, the, in those works see by the sweat of his face he's going to have to clear the land before they were in the garden it, the the trees were in full fruition it was just 
it was a free for all. We'll put it that way. <laughs> free for all. <laughs> but now he's got to work for it. Okay. So that's a death. You got that death down there. They're buried. And, and through childbearing, it says here um, that they would be saved because one Yahshua would come through um, the, that righteous lineage on the way all the way down to the, the, what turns out to be the 63rd uh, generation of the flesh. And let me just sidetrack real quick. If you want to uh, pull up the, um, the green chart, if you would, because you have a, a beautiful witness on your body of the 63rd generation of the flesh. And you can go right in your Bible and you can check this out because Yahshua's, um, his lineage is, is recorded in there. And you're going to find that there were 63 generations of the flesh down to Yahshua. So all the way to the right hand side there, you've got a picture of your brain and then your spinal cord coming down and you've got those, those nerves. You see, see right there. See where it says 31 pairs. So you've got 31 pairs of nerves. That's 62. And then on the bottom there, you'll see he's got illustrated. You go down just a uh, touch more. See that, that felum terminale? That's, um, that's Latin for the final thread or the last thread. And that's, that's, that's what that 63rd nerve is. And that's pointing to Yahshua, how that, that he, he was the final thread of, of those generations coming on down. And he, all his mission to fulfill is wrapped up in all those things that were carried out in the law and the prophets before time. So just a beautiful witness on your body of how that Yahshua will come in and fulfill the, all those things that were written in the law and the prophets. Okay. <clears throat> so, we picked up the, the, the gospel there, and um, it is, uh, um, let's go to Romans 1 and 16. I just want to kind of drive this home, this point home, because um, I'm on the same page as Paul, because I'm not ashamed of the gospel one little bit either. Okay, so let's just read Romans 1 16, please. Romans 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation. To the, every that day. gospel, it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation. Now that's something, folks. <laughs> that's, that's how Yahweh is manifesting his power of salvation through the preaching of this gospel. And, and it might be foolishness to some. See, and then it's even picked up in the book of how that who through the foolishness of preaching that they might be saved. You see? Okay, go ahead and finish that up. Sorry for interrupting. For it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To oh, the wait a minute. To everyone that believeth. You see? Okay, read. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay, so the, there is some believing here. Now, we're not talking about no vain repetitions here. Dr. Kinley would talk about how that these correlations see that are being run on these charts that we have are going to read, re, are going to lead to the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah, you see? And he put it even this way, because we've got a principle of 40 that runs all the way down through there. If you want to go back to the elementary chart, I'll run just a few of these, because you've got a... a an overturning, an overturning, overturning. And the way that he put it was if you get hit over the head enough times, maybe with a two by four, let's say <laughs> 40 times, you might get it. <laughs> you might just get it. And that's mercy. Let me tell you, you know, it, that's just a, a funny way of, of putting it that how he put it, but it's merciful that he repeats this thing. That's a great repeating. And uh, that's going to lead me here. Let, let's go to um, Isaiah 28. Eight, and you can start at eight. Isaiah twenty-eight and nine. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Mm -hmm. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. That's line right. Upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. You see that? 
see with the stammering lips and another tongue. You see, and, and even when you go back to Moses, you see, he, he tells Yahweh, I'm not eloquent of speech. He was a stutter. And this is a, you know, you can see this as a, as a great repeating or a stuttering down through the law and the prophets or this, the principles or precepts, the line upon line. You see, you got that bloodline going through. You see, you got that water line going through there and you got that spirit line going through there. Just like I was talking with Adam, now it's the same with Noah here. He was given a vision by Yahweh Elohim that the end of all flesh has come before him. You see, that's definitely a death. When Yahweh says the end of all flesh has come, you see, that's a death. And um, there's a principle of blood with Noah being the watchman back there. On the chart, you're going to receive, you're going to see the Ezekiel 36 chapters on there, and you're going to read that if the watchman seeth the danger, I'm just going to cut it off. The watchman see the danger coming and warn not the people, then the blood is on his head. But if he sees the danger and he warns the people, the blood is on their head. So Noah is as a watchman there because guess what? For 120 years, he was in preparation and building the ark and telling them that salvation was to get in there. You see, or putting the blood on the people's head. So that's putting the blood on the people's head there. So then you got a principle of water quite obviously that rains 40 days and 40 nights. The spirit closes the door. So that's blood, water, spirit, 40. Right there with Noah. And let me backtrack to Adam real quick. Now, this is, you know, we would have never, you could read the Bible, I don't care how many times, and people do. They It's good bedtime reading for them, you know, and I'm not saying discouraging to read the bible but what i'm saying is you're not going to get in there and figure this thing out without a divine vision and revelation that's not how it works you see so but revealed uh through this vision revelation we can show how that um that they were in the garden for 40 days you see and how you do that is according to moses's trips to the mount you see because on the first trip moses goes up he's told that it, um, to tell the people that the law is going to be spoke down and that they need to clean up. And then the second trip, he goes up. And I'm just cutting it up quick. And you can go back and you can check these things out. It's right in your books of Exodus, you see. But on the second trip, he goes up. <clears throat> and he's given the vision, you see, of Yahweh Elohim in the pattern. And Yahweh Elohim shows how he brings in the creation. And he shows Moses in a sequence of six days of creation and he rests on the seventh day you see <clears throat> so he sees them in the garden in in a peaceful state or in a restful state that's what that's how they were up there you see they were one with yahweh now you've got 33 days after that where he explains to moses the inner workings of the tabernacle and the, and the priesthood right Okay, so there's your 33 days. So they're at rest in 33 days. Now on the third trip, he goes up because on the second trip, he does not see the, them transgress the law. He doesn't see that. And that's why when he comes down and um, has the tables, the first tables of stone in his hand, and this is, this is awesome that I'm being led this way because this is actually where I wanted to go, I was talking about that, that broken heart, you see, or that broken law. But let me finish here. So... He comes down after that second trip, and, and Joshua, who the world calls Joshua, we know is Yahshua. One of the, it's a great mystery. Yahshua says, I hear a noise of war in the camp. Moses says, no, that's the, they're joyful. You see him coming out. Well, he should have listened to Yahshua. <laughs> that was a war, noise of war in the camp. And when he recognized that, it says that he waxed hot. So he, and he threw down that first table of stone. Well, how did, why did he not know that they were going to, that woman, you see, back there because that was Yahweh's woman Israel I'm talking about Israel now you see even my bride he calls him his bride he didn't realize that they were going to be adulterous you see and transgressing the law at that time because he hadn't seen Adam he didn't have it hadn't been revealed to him in the vision yet okay so now going back to the third trip he goes up he gets a repeat of the of the creation you see in a seven day sequence and he sees them transgress the law and come out of the garden that's your act that's your seven days so you take the 33 days from the second trip of them at rest and the seven day now we wouldn't have figured that out without a divine vision revelation no man's figuring this stuff out 
So that's 40 days in the garden, according to Moses' vision. Okay. Now, so if you, you want to go back to the elementary chart, I just want to run a few lines here, and then I want to work a little bit with the covenants, and I'll, I'll have my seat. <clears throat> so uh, you, you go back here. We, we ran blood, water, spirit with 40 with Noah. Now with uh, Abraham and King Melchizedek here, you've got Abraham and Isaac being illustrated here in the court roundabout portion of the of that plate. And you've got um, Yahweh Elohim is, tells Abraham that he's going to offer up his son, Isaac, you see. And so Isaac is dead and buried in Abraham's old mind there. Excuse me. And um, you've got Abraham's old mind. And really, our, this is the same chart that we have up. And I use this example a lot. But Abraham's is an, is an older gentleman there. His hair should be white. And the, and the reason I say that is because Yahshua, in fulfillment of this, he's, he's dead and buried in the whitewashed sepulcher in that tomb. That's just like Isaac, the promised son, being dead and buried in Abraham's old mind, you see. And you've got your blood principle there because Yahweh tells him, and Abraham is confident, you see, because he's already seen Isaac delivered from the from a death-like state or be raised from the dead once because he's an old man. Sarah has been barren and way past childbearing years, and yet, and yet the promise is given to him and and Yahweh uh does this this deed for him and Isaac comes forth from a dead womb so you've got a death-like state there you see he's buried in that well what am I going to do and Sarah tells him take my handmaid Hagar and that's how you get Ishmael so on and so forth there's there's a lot to talk about but <laughs> you got a death burial and resurrection see Isaac is resurrected so Abraham's got confidence that Yahweh is going to do this. And he, so when, when Isaac asked the question there, when you read about it in Genesis, he says, I see the, the, the fire and, and, you know, so on and so forth, but where's the sacrifice? <laughs> and, and Abraham says, Yahweh will provide a sacrifice. He is confident. He is faithful in the operation of Yahweh here. All right. So that, that ram caught in the thicket, you see, is offered up instead of Isaac. Now that's blood, you see. Now, the water principle, you've got uh, Abraham is an older man, like I said. He, he, they're going up a journey on a mountain with the materials that, you know, he's, he's cleaved that wood to Isaac. So you've got some sweat and you, got, you probably got some tears with Abraham going up there thinking he's going to have to offer up his son, you see. And then you've got that spirit principle with the angel stays his hand, you see, because he's going to offer up Isaac. He's got the knife in his hand. So this angel there stays his hand, that spirit. Now the 40, you've got at the, the time of Isaac being offered up there, he's some 25 years old because, you know, I had this concept too that like, hey, he's a, he's a little boy. He wasn't exactly a little boy. He was being obedient because I'm pretty sure a 25-year-old usually can take a 100-year-old, although when you're living 600 years, I don't know, 100 is like the new 15. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. That that's That's something that, we can go on to learn about. Anyways, you had Ishmael is 40 years old at the time that uh, Abraham offers up Isaac there because he's 15 years, about 15 years older than uh, Isaac. So there's your blood, water, spirit, 40 there. Now going to the migration of the children of Israel, you've got uh, the blood of the lamb, that Passover lamb. They're told to take out that lamb on the 10th day and hold it over to the 14th and offered up in the evening so the whole congregation is going to kill it and then they're told for that death angel to pass over to take its blood to strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts and they're dipping from a basin of blood at the bottom that's your four points of blood there with the passover lamb so you got blood you've got water when they go through the parted waters of the red sea that's your water and it, they were led by the spirit just like we're led of the spirit you see you, you try to get out of bed sometime without lifting your head. You see and that? That gives you an example of being led by the Spirit, you see, because that's really your most holy place is um, correlative to where Yahweh would, would dwell. And so, anyways, you've got that principle of them led, led of the Spirit. And listen, 
you know, you take a look at this creation and all the migration of the, the birds and the whales and the butterflies and, and, and these things that animals are able to accomplish. I mean, we have a lot of animals here on our farm and the intelligence that is imbued in these simple creatures, like we we're having lambs right now, right? They just, it is just in, they know where to go, you know, and they call that instinct out of the world, but they're taking the credit. They're not giving the credit where the credit is due. And that spirit law, the, this creation is being led by the spirit, you see? And, <laughs> so they were led by the spirit back there. And then uh, because of their disobedience, see, because they did not believe the true report when the spies go over, see, it could have been 40 days, but it's going to be 40 years, you see? Uh, there so that's that's blood water spirit 40 with the migration of the children of israel now right in your pattern you see in your tabernacle pattern this is you had daily you had an evening and a morning sacrifices that were being offered up and also you had sacrifices being offered up for the people's sins back there and the blood of the sacrifice was put on the four horns at the four corners of that altar that's your four points of blood that that labor there was a washing of the sacrifice above, and there was also a place where the priest could wash himself. Waters, waters above, and waters beneath. You see, so that's water, and that's that horn of holy anointing oil. When the incoming priest was anointed, so that he could officiate in the tabernacle. You see, that signified the spirit upon him. You see, and so that's blood, water, spirit, and you got forty steps. You see, in your holy place, or in other words, there's. There's 10 from the door to the table of shoebread, 10 to the uh, altar of incense, 10 to the lampstand, and then 10 back to your door. Okay. So you've got 40 steps there in your holy place. So that's blood, water, steer at 40. And these things give us confidence in the fact that when Yahshua, if you want to go down to Yahshua now, because I got, I already talked about how the search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and we could go in we could say oh i could run more lines than anybody you know i i got this thing figured out guess what if it doesn't bring you to yashua it's for naught if you talk talk about vain if you don't get past that cross you see and see that those things that were spoken of were the gospel that was according to the scriptures but if it doesn't bring you to yashua it's <laughs> you haven't gone far enough <laughs> put it that way so when you go down to yashua you're going to see how that he they he was crucified you see and they hung him on that cross so he's got four points of blood on him he's nailed in his left hand nailed in his right hand and nailed in his feet and then they press that crown of thorns on his head why a crown of thorns well for, for we talked about that ram caught in the thicket that's that's a thorns around his head as an example back there you see, he was the sacrifice provided. Now, the reality of it, Yahshua is the sacrifice that's provided. So there's a crown of thorn pressed on him. And, you know, um, by this is just something. Well, let me go to the prophets first. In Jonah, there's a nice example. When you read about Jonah in the fish's belly, you see, he talks about that the weeds were wrapped about my head. Why would he talk about the weeds wrapped about his head? That's a funny thing to put in there. Well, if you've ever seen seaweed, you see, it's got little pricky, it's got thorns to it, you see? So he's got like a crown of thorns there in the prophets. So Yahshua comes in, of course, he's going to have that crown of thorns <clears throat> pressed upon his head. So there's your four points of blood, the two, his two hands, his feet, and the crown of thorns. Now also, he's pierced in the side after he has expired, you see? And that's where you get your water principle. So he's pierced in the side. And there's just so much, you know, and what, just a little tidbit today from one of the morning Zoom sessions I um, listened to, um, you know, they were talking about mass, Catholic, Roman Catholic mass and how that they talk about that that's the actual body. And then that cup is the actual blood of Jesus Christ, you see, and they break it. They even say they break, they break the bread and they give it to you. You see, well, he, he. Uh, right in there, it talks about how that the scripture might be fulfilled. No bone could be broken. And yet they're saying this is the actual, his actual body and they break it. But in, in the book, it talks about how no bone of, could be broken. And that's why when the soldier comes and it, 
you know, breaks the legs of the one on his on his left side, breaks the legs of the one on his right side. But when it comes to Yahshua, can't break his legs. He pierces, he pierces him in the side, and out forth comes blood and water. So there's your blood. That's your water. And guess what? He's raised a quickening spirit, not no physical body like a lot of people in the world believe. Because that's just, there's just, you don't, you don't want that. You wouldn't want to be raised a physical body. You see, and people got that. They got, you know, you're going to go out into heaven and play golf. And it's all this carnal. It's all this carnal stuff. Not realizing that this is a, to, to know Yahweh Elohim, <clears throat> Yahshua in the reality of this thing. Just like in, it talks about in John 4, 24, they that worship Yahweh must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, you, you just don't want to get caught up in this flesh because it is a, it can be a trap. But you know what? It can. This is a nice example of how you, there's all you can look at the, the cup half full or the cup half empty. <laughs> I don't know. That's that's more theological stuff. But anyways, I'm getting rambling. The word cell. You know, you each human body here has trillions of cell. Now you can use it as a play on words, and right in the word it says C L. I mean, that's how it's actually spelled too, with with two L's. C L. And that's really what the uh, the structure of a cell is showing you, Yahweh Elohim, and how that he's a pattern, and you're made by that pattern. But also, the word cell can be like you getting locked up in a cell. This body can also be a trap, <laughs> so it can go both ways. So you want to you want to watch out getting too dive too deep into the flesh. And believe me, I I've been there. So, <clears throat> anyways. Uh, this, this gospel that Paul was talking about that he's not ashamed of there in Romans 1 16. Uh, why don't we go back there and I'll, I'll try to get ground a little bit. And then I'm going to, I want to get, uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 after you finish Romans. Um, and then, um, I'll, probably, I'll have my seat. Romans 1 yes, 16. Sir. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, for right. it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to yeah. everyone that believeth, to the mm -hmm. Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, to the, to the God. Jew first and then also to the Greek or also to what we call Gentile. You see, sometimes you say the, the barbarian. There's all kinds of different ways that it's described in different books but really as far as Yahweh's concerned there was there was jew and there was gentile there was a division back there but guess what that division or that 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 wall of partition that paul calls it that's broke down after yahshua outpours the holy spirit on the believing jews and then seven years later onto the belie believing gentiles you see there is no more greek or jew you see there's no more jew or gentile but but in the, and really, it's an inward job. So there is an there is an inward Jew, as it were. But as far as these things concerning the flesh go, that that stuff is out. You see that 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 wall of partition has been torn down. Okay. All right. Go ahead and finish there, please. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith. See now therein, you see. Therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith. You see, and this kind of takes me back to that you got to, you must believe that he is, you see, and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. And without faith, see, this is in Hebrews 11 chapter, 11 and 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, if it's impossible to create, to please your creator without faith, wouldn't you want to get yourself some faith? <laughs> and i'm not saying that you just it's a big choosing thing or anything like that i'm saying that when yahweh reveals himself to you you want to you want to know as much as you possibly can so that you can be sealed in this thing and even the founder admonished us to come to class be on time be there learn all that you can learn because you're going to need it to keep you steadfast you see and the things that are happening out here in the world <laughs> hallelujah that we have this great truth to see keep us steadfast because people get shaken up easy you see and and it's it ain't gonna get any better it's not gonna get any better 
Okay. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, 31. I want to just touch on the covenants real quick. Cause it, it, it remind me that of um, the scripture reading, how that he talked about that he come to bind up the brokenhearted, you see, and proclaim yeah. liberty to the captives. Jeremiah 31 and 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although okay. I was a husband unto them. Yeah, and he was a good husband unto them, you see. All right, so he's establishing here, you see, that he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, you didn't hear anything about a Gentile in there either. He's going to be making that new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And it's not going to be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out of the land of Egypt, you see. So it's quite obvious that that, that old covenant is the covenant that was spoke down by um, Yahweh Elohim from Mount Sinai. And the people, uh, you know, they, they said all that Yahweh said we will do and be obedient, you see. And how long did that last? Not even 40 days that Moses went up there. They broke it, you see, built a golden calf and said, this be the Elohim that brought us out of the land of Egypt. Broke one of the <laughs> one of the, the, the primary ten, you know. We say, boy, if we were back there, we wouldn't have done that oh yes you would have <laughs> because guess what it, the heart wasn't in them yet you see they did not have the heart to be obedient and so you know you can't uh, plus he always he's he's working his purpose here it's part of his purpose that they're going to break that so <clears throat> it 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 reminds me you see of how that moses he he throws down that first table of stone you see and they they break that old law you see and um there's the there's a couple ways of looking at this you see one is that it, those tables they weren't in a tombstone like maybe you see on some movies or in some illustrations of the ten commandments those ten commandments were in two stones that were come together in the shape of a heart you see and when they he cast those stones down that was like Israel breaking Yahweh's heart, you see, and he was a good husband unto them, and they, they were an adulterous bride, you see, continually, um, you know, practicing all idolatry and, uh, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff, but he would bring, she would have them back, and he would forgive them, and, you know, and there's, you know, you go through the law and the prophets, and you, you can read all about the Israel, you know, they like when the judges would come in, as long as the judge was there and Israel was being obedient, everything was cool. <laughs> and then the judge would pass and Israel would go crazy again. And then they, Yahweh would put them in servitude or bondage to one of those nations, you see, and it would go back and forth and back and forth. And you know what? We have, it talks about that those things were written for our admon admonition, you see, or we can look back there and see those examples or in samples, you see. And you know what? We, we say, well, we, I wouldn't have done that. I would have done, oh yeah, you would have, because you know, I would have, I'm just saying, I'm talking my own self now, because you know what? I've made mistakes and I've made the same mistake twice sometimes, you see, and I've done dumb things and I've done, you know, I, it, it's a repeat, but it's a learning process. And Yahweh is patient with us. You see, he is merciful. This is, this is part of how he, he exudes his nat his very nature and showing us on, on how, how he is so merciful you see <clears throat> these the, the, and that's it's also um you know how that um you have um systems of the body that um correlate with the different um nine primary attributes of yahweh you see well in your body there's a constant cleansing going on a constant cleansing going on through your excretory system it's always getting rid of impurities and impurities. Now, if that's the example in your body to look at, and that's showing really the, the beauty of Yahweh. Now, isn't it beautiful? How much more beautiful is it that he can excrete those theories, concepts, and opinions, those, all that false junk that we are fed out in the world and come to a true knowledge and understanding of Yahweh, our how he is, how he really is and actually exists. Now, isn't that... It, it, 
if we could just get a <laughs> I think I've heard of it put this way if you could just get a keyholes a knot hole view of how great it's going to be to worship Yahweh Elohim outside of this physical body you wouldn't ever want to come back okay so going back to the covenants you five, see, minutes. Five, five minutes okay thank you so going back to the covenants for Jeremiah 31 31 he's going to make that new covenant now, this new covenant isn't going to be like that old covenant because there was that old covenant. If you want to bring up the um, covenants chart, please. I'll just run right through this quickie quick. Uh, the the co old covenant had carnal ordinances. You see, in a physical way of worship. You see, they had physical tabernacle. They had a physical temple back there. You see, there was gifts and sacrifices and physical water baptisms, ceremonies and suppers, uh, just to name a few. You see in that Ten Commandment law. Now he said through the prophet um, Jeremiah, see that's Yahweh speaking. That's what we need to keep in mind too. These are a man's thoughts. This this school is about what thus saith Yahweh. And what Yahweh says there is it's not going to be according to this covenant that I made with your fathers in the day I took them by the hand. So what's that mean? It's not going to be a physical law. See back there, they and the Jews still, they got it written all over their clothing. They got it, you know what I mean? <clears throat> it's not going to be that way. This is an inside job. And how he accomplished this is him going through his death, his burial, and resurrection. And don't forget his ministry too, according to the scriptures. And he, how did he minister unto them but to go to the, it even it talks about how that <clears throat> when he goes after he raises from the dead, you um, go to Luke. Uh, let's I'll finish with this. Go to Luke 24, start at 25. So he that new covenant is going to be written, not with pen and ink, but with the finger of the living, the living Elohim in the tables of the heart. You see, it's going to be written right within you, not external. See, now, if that's written in with you, then you can start you can start being obedient. You see, when you got do right in you, then you can start doing right. Isn't in the, and that's the way, that's Yahweh's righteousness revealed from faith to faith. You see, that, that outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel, that's the, <clears throat> that's the new covenant written in the hearts of man and mind, mankind. So, uh, Luke 24. Luke 24, 25. Mm -hmm. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, Oh, fool. Now, isn't that something how to start off a conversation with someone? Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe. Read. All that the prophets have spoken. Mm -hmm. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and to yep. enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see that? That's how Yahshua, even after his death, burial, and resurrection, that's how he was teaching back there. That's how he was getting this thing across. He went to the law and to the prophets or the testimony. And he didn't just go just in a little bit. He expounded unto them all the things contained in there concerning himself. See, those the law and the prophets, it's written of him. You see, and he did come in and fulfill the things that were written of there. He didn't, st he didn't institute nothing as far as... A, a way of worship goes. But what he did is he established a new law with the house of Israel and the house of Judah and, and us as being Gentiles are grafted in by faith. So what you want to do is get yourself some faith. And um, the best way to do that is to keep coming to class and testify and preach and glorify Yahweh Elohim Yahshua. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Justin Snyder. For our next speaker, we'd like to call on Dr. Dotson Wallace. Good evening, class. Good evening. I thoroughly enjoyed the words and remarks of the previous speaker. I um down here in Atlanta a couple of days ago, it was raining real bad and so much, so much rain that it had me thinking about, well, being a being a part of this teaching, it gets you in the practice of looking for Yahshua or looking to learn something, using the physical to understand something about his purpose, pattern, and plan, and the gospel. 
And um, we're taught to, the key to that is the tabernacle pattern. Now, the pattern is a threefold pattern with the most holy place, holy place and court roundabout, but it also has um, vessels in the pattern. And each of those vessels represent or correspond to Yahshua the Messiah somehow in some way. For instance, that altar of incense shows how Yahshua the Messiah is the only intercessor between man and the Father. Or the seven branch lamp fan shows how Yahshua the Messiah is the um, illumination to man's soul out of this darkness. And um, so the brazen labor is no exception. It um, has some things about Yahshua Messiah. So let's talk about that for a while and then see how this rain principle or inundation or burial principle is shown with this um, vessel. Um, the labor has a dual function. The priest would wash the sacrifices in the labor before placing it on the altar. Also, the priest would wash himself in the labor after, um, well, after he's washed, then he's anointed with oil and then he's able to officiate in the holy place. So the first principle, we could see a washing or a baptism or an immersion unto death. Um, the second principle, we could kind of see a washing of regeneration or an immersion unto life. Let's talk about the first principle first, um, this immersion unto death. Um, let's go to Genesis 3. 6 through 17. And the first speaker um, talked about this, this discourse. Genesis, the third chapter and the sixth verse. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of the both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim amongst the trees of the garden. And Yahweh Elohim called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim called unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast Hearken unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Okay, you can stop right there. So we can see a change happen right here. Before, 
he transgressed at before Adam transgressed the law that Yahweh Elohim had given him. He walked with him. He communed with him. He had a relationship with Yahweh Elohim. After Adam transgressed his law, after he ate of that fruit, he lost that connection and was instantaneously condemned or buried or inundated or immersed in condemnation. His soul was in a dark, buried state. And you'll find out that time didn't change this. It didn't heal over time. A few generations later, we could go down to um, Genesis 6, 5 through 7. Genesis, the sixth chapter, fifth verse. And Yahweh Elohim saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented Yahweh that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And Yahweh Elohim said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Okay, you can start right there. So I just want to show that hundreds of years after Adam's transgression, man's heart and mind was still immersed or still buried or in condemnation in darkness. <laughs> Even to the point where Yahweh, he buried them with physical water. And it's funny, Everybody that got wet with that physical water died. Um, the persons that were, I say it like this, the persons that were in the vessel of salvation, they didn't get wet and they lived. You could say the same thing. You could say in a sense that the water saved them. In a sense, I, the, we know the ark is what saved them. But you could kind of see the same thing with the children of Israel at the Red Sea. The children of Israel walked through following that cloud on dry ground through the tunnel of waters of the Red Sea. Pharaoh attempted to cross the Red Sea. He got wet and he drowned. Once again, somebody else got wet with physical water or immersed in physical water and they died. It was a principle of an immersion unto death. The church of the Israel went through transition to a new state of life in the wilderness. They didn't get wet and they lived. So mankind, you see, is immersed or buried in darkness or condemnation, and it stayed like that until the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua Messiah and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about the second immersion principle, the washing or, or of regeneration. The priests would wash themselves before officiating in the holy place. This was a washing of regeneration or a cleansing, an immersion of clean water to rid themselves of the filth that they had accumulated in the court roundabout. Very, very interesting because that's exactly what the gospel does, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So we see the dual principle being manifested with the labor. The problem with physical immersion or physical baptism in physical water is the same problem with the rest of the law, statutes, and judgments that the previous speaker was telling us about, the ceremonies and all of those. They are physical. They, it's a physical wor a worship given to a particular people for a schoolmaster and not the reality. Um, real quick, can we get Hebrews 9 and 1? First, the ninth chapter and the first verse. Then, verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a world sanctuary. Could you skip that? There was a tabernacle. Oh, excuse me, ninth verse, please. I'm sorry. Skip down to the ninth verse. Ninth verse, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. 
which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Okay, you can start right there. See, so we should not look to the law to see how to physically worship God just like those people did back in the day because that's what they did and it's written in the book. We should use the scriptures for what it says, for reproof, for correction and doctrine. We should use them to see confirmation of how Yahshua or how Yahweh is saving. The previous speaker got Jeremiah 31 and 31, which talks about, um, behold, he will give us a new, uh, let's just get it again. I don't want to mess it up. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the day is come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I make with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Okay, you can start right there. So we can see it, it's not going to be no more physical or outward law. He's going to put his law in you. Um, Ezekiel 11, 19 through 20. Let's get another witness. Ezekiel 11 and 19. And I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within them. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. That they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their Elohim. Okay, you can stop right there. All right, so let's... um. Let's go back to Moses so we could see an example of um, a positive immersion or uh, I'll just leave it like that. Let's go to Exodus 16, 11 through 15. Let's see. Exodus 16 and 11. Yes, ma'am. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up. Behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is man. For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which Yahweh hath given you to eat. Okay. I went here because this is... Um... Yahweh is raining down physical substance, life-giving substance from a physically high place, and it saved their physical lives. See, Yahweh, and remember, this is schoolmaster. Yahweh is showing us that's exactly what he's going to do for our soul. He is going to rain down spiritual substance, and it's going to save our souls. Um, he's showing us how he's going to accomplish that for our souls. It's an immersion through the preaching of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. Because we remember, because we're talking about a baptism, immersion, or, or a burial unto uh, redemption, on, we'll say on the positive side. Um, let's do Deuteronomy 32 and 2. Deuteronomy 
33 and 2. My doctrine shall drop as rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Okay, see, and distillation is like a cleansing process. It's a, it's a cleaning. So he's saying that his doctrine or his, his gospel, the stuff that he's going to preach is going to be a cleansing. Um, let's do Psalms 12 and 6, please. Psalms 12 and 6. The words of Yahweh are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth. Purified seven times. So you see that? It's to, he, he's reiterating that it's a cleansing, uh, uh, purified silver. Have you ever seen how they get silver? It don't come out the ground shiny and 100% silver. They have to break it up from the rock and melt it, boil it. Some metals they have to uh, put in acid. It's a rough cleansing treatment to get to the pure stuff. And that, again, that's what the gospel or the immersion unto life is going to do to you. These are the words of y'all. These are the death, burial, and resurrection that Yahshua Messiah is going to go through. Um, Ezekiel 36, um, 25 and 27, please. Ezekiel 36 and 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. See, Yahweh is continually telling us that it was never really about physical immersion or, or physical rain. But he is telling us. It's going to be living water or spiritual rain or this gospel being preached. And, and he gives us some good examples of it. Let's go to one that we all know. Let's go to Ezekiel 37, 1 through 5. Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, first verse. The hand of Yahweh was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. Then he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Yahweh, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Okay, you can stop right there. Because the bones are souls, and they are dry because they don't have the living water or the spirit of Elohim in them to make them alive. And so what did he tell them to do? He said to prophesy or preach the gospel to them. And then they would become living souls or he would enter into them and they would be alive. Once again, we see Yahweh letting us know that it's going to be living water by preaching. And that's how you're going to receive it. And through the revelation of Yahshua Messiah. Let's go to another one that we are. Um, I think we know. Um, let's go to Luke 16. 23 through 31. 
the sixteenth chapter and twenty third verse. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us, excuse me, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into the place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Y'all see that everybody, this guy, the rich man was being tormented and wanted some physical water to soothe himself or to um, ease his torment. And Abraham, who was, was uh, playing the figure of Yahshua Messiah, was like, nah, you can't do that. So then he was like, well, can you send somebody from the dead so my brothers won't come here or, and be tormented? Since do something physical, some other sign physical sign that they won't come here. And Yahshua Messiah said, nope. Or Abraham said, nope, they will have to have, they have to get it like everybody else. They have to hear Moses and the prophets. So you see, he offered him, he asked for physical water, but the type of Yahshua Messiah offered him living water, the gospel, the law and the prophets. So he told them he, they had to hear Moses. That's the gospel of Yahshua Messiah. That's living water. He asked for physical water. Yahshua offered them living water. And that's amazing to me. So um, you find that um, Yahshua the Messiah fulfills both of those um, principles of the label. Just like, like I said, every vessel in the pattern corresponds to some aspect or shows some aspect of um, Yahshua Messiah. So let's go to Matthew 3 and 11. Matthew, the third chapter, and the eleventh verse. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Can you skip to 13? 13. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me? And Yahshua answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. All right. So you see Yahshua Messiah first, there is the um, the sacrificial lamb. And so Yahshua Messiah is coming to be immersed because he is the sacrifice of Yahweh. He's going by a pattern and he's fulfilling. So he that uh, sacrifice had to be immersed. So he has to be immersed. But also Yahshua the Messiah is um, the high priest. He's the ultimate high priest. Just like that high priest made an atonement every year 
in the wilderness to Yahweh in the uh, most holy place, Yahshua Messiah is making an atonement to the Father, but he's one time will do it for him, and it'll be an atonement made forever. He is the ultimate high priest. So he's also the high priest um, washed himself before he was officiated. So Yahshua Messiah is coming to be immersed. And then just like the high priest would be anointed with oil after he is immersed at that baptism, then John sees in the vision him being anointed with the Holy Spirit or the spirit descending on him, letting him know this is the one, this is the guy. And then he starts his ministry. Um, and we could get John 1 and 29 and see that um, he even calls him the lamb. If you just want to get it that quick. John 1, 29. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh. The next day, John seeth Yahshua coming unto him and saith, Behold the lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sin of the world. All right. So. And then Yahshua fulfills or or brings his promise into fruition in Acts, the second chapter, one through four, when he rains down the Holy Spirit in uh, on the 120 um, Hebrews. And that was spiritual fire, spiritual water or spiritual inundation unto life. And then he did it for us, the rest of us, um, the Gentiles, I think in Acts, the 10th chapter for the Gentiles. So Yahshua, Yahshua us it in a new kingdom age where we worship him in spirit and in truth. And now we are immersed in the Holy Spirit and not in the water. We are immersed in the name of Yahweh and immersed in this vision. We are immersed in fellowship with the brethren in the body of Yahshua the Messiah. And, um, and he did that with the foolishness of preaching. It, it didn't happen by me stop cussing or stop drinking or stop smoking or helping old ladies across the street or I'm going to keep the first 10 commandments or I'm going to flog myself um, when, when I think it's time for the crucifixion to show that I get on the cross too. It was not done by anything physical. It was done by the preaching of the gospel of Yahshua Messiah, which is the death, burial, and resurrection. And I will end with a uh, second re- Second Corinthians three and three. Second Corinthians three and three. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of the Messiah, an epistle is a letter. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the Living Elohim, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. All right. And so with those few words, I thank Yahweh for letting me see his purpose and pattern and his son in the littlest things like a rainy day. Um, I hope someone was edified. All praises go Yahshua Messiah. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Dotson Wallace. For our next speaker, we'd like to call on the dean of the Arcourt New York class, Dr. Bonnie Schneider. Well, good evening. I was all comfortable. <laughs> and I was expecting maybe Najee would give us a little something, but oh, whatever. <laughs> um, I'm very happy and glad to be here. I'm glad that we got to spend the last three Wednesdays with you. It's been very enjoyable. Um, I, I really have enjoyed class tonight. I, I think it's wonderful when People just stick to the doctrine and just go for it. <laughs> uh, you know, that's our that's our theme song around here. So um, I think that I'll, let, let's get John. Um, let me see. I don't know where I want to go. I wasn't really thinking about getting up. All right. Let's go to uh, John 14 and 6. I think it is. <laughs> John 14 and 6. Yahshua said, unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
Okay, so Yahshua, when he's walking around on the earth plane, and he has a mission when he's walk, when he he's fulfilling what's written in the law and the testimony. But he's saying to them now, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, that's a that's a big statement. Even to say that you're the way. <laughs> Um, it's not something most people would say about themselves. Well, I'm the way <laughs> to anything, you know, but um, so let's look at the word way for a little, a little bit, and then maybe I'll try to get some scriptures on it if I can remember some, um, because I think it's important to know the, the way, well, I know that it's important to know the way that Yahweh set up that we would know him. It's a certain way. And it, we never want to forget that if we didn't have these examples in the law and the testimony, like if you didn't have all the stuff about baptism back there, if you never went back there to find out anything about baptism, if you didn't go back to the tabernacle, if you didn't have the tabernacle, you know what would happen to you? You'd end up just like the Christians are. They got all their modes of baptism. They don't baptize in the name. They just have their own way of doing everything they just uh, they just pick up something in the bible and they think oh baptism jesus was baptized we should get baptized not knowing what yahshua's purpose was not knowing what was written about in the law and the testimony not realizing that there was baptism unto death and a baptism unto life not you know we none of us would know anything if it weren't for this vision and revelation which was delivered unto dr kinley and he has graciously delivered these things unto us same vision see and so anyway let's go back to yashua's the way the truth and the life and think about the the word way how he is that way and before i do that i think i just want to show you one example because it's right here in front of me on this chart and i think it's so important is and it's something, you know, I may have already said it in this class, because it's just, it's just something that is always hit me so hard when you look at these charts, is that if you look at Yahshua the Messiah as being pointed out as the Lamb of Yahweh, behold the Lamb of Yahweh, that's right on the plate you're looking at. And so that's, he's the Lamb of Yahweh. And then if you go over to the children of Israel, there's a lamb that was taken out on the 10th and he was held over to the 14th and he was killed on the 14th day and that lamb and you have the whole you know we go through the book of exodus and we've been doing that lately in the on that morning class that some of us try to go to when we can anyway the you have the passover there and all the things that are written in the passover and you have you see the cross right there on this plate and that's showing you that that and, and it's right on that that verse is right on that cross too. I know you can't see it, but it's on there where it says John 1 and 29, that that's the lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so the lamb that was killed down in Egypt, he's pointing to the lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sin of the world. And that's another thing along with baptism and, and baptism and, and uh, Passover or your, what do you call the Passover supper, the Lord's supper, what they call the Lord's supper in the, in the churches. Those are the two strongholds in Christianity that, pe that are really hard for people to get past, you know, and those are the things that almost all your churches still practice. They practice that Passover supper, or I forget what they call it, the Lord's supper, I guess. And, and then they, they practice communion. And then they practice also baptism, see? So those are those two strongholds. And in, here in the, in the 12th chapter of Exodus, let's go to the 12th chapter of Exodus. Would you read that for me? And then we'll look at this chart while we're doing it. Exodus, the 12th chapter and the first verse. Uh-huh. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, Uh-huh. This month shall be unto you the beginning of month. Now, this month is going to be unto you the beginning of months. And that right there, we just started January 1st, and the whole world thinks January 1st is the first month of the year. No, April 1st is the first month of the year. That's what Yahweh said. You understand? So he says this month's going to be the first month of the year to you. 
And then they go on and, and you know what the, the whole chapter, and it's a long chapter, but it tells you how they took out the lamb, how he had to have the four points of blood on, the, you had, they had to have the four points of the lamb's blood on the door, how they took it out in the evening, and all those things are pointing out Yahshua the Messiah and how he was going to die. And see, in the gospel is how Yahshua died. So unless you have these scriptures, Unless you go back to the law and the testimony, which, by the way, are Yahweh's documented witnesses, they, he had them written down, you know. So he, unless you go to those documented witnesses, you can have any imagination you want to about what he was doing when he was eating the Passover supper. When he ate the Passover supper with his apostles and the Christians pick it up, the world picks it up. Because Yahshua, well, who they called Jesus, see, because he did it, we're supposed to do it. And they don't know that he's fulfilling. They don't know that it was a memorial back there. They don't know that he, they killed the lamb back there. They don't know. And so they come up with a little idea of what it should be like. And they give you a little thimble of either grape juice or wine and a little bitty wafer to break and eat. All right. And so those things that's your imagination of how you're going to worship and you know please your creator by doing such a thing and it's such a small thing compared to what was done back in exodus and what pointed yahshua out and then what yahshua did you know they think they're doing something by taking a little bit of grape juice and, and it, it's just you know, I know we don't see these things unless, unless we've been taught these things. But think about what a small thing it is. Well, here, you come up to the altar and you take a little bit of grape juice or a little bit of uh, wine and you take a little wafer and you go out there thinking you've done something. And where in Exodus, you'd see all the details of what they had to do. So even if you thought you were keeping the law, that was that was set up back there with the children of Israel. They ain't even doing it wrong, right? You understand? They're they're not eating lamb. They're not eating unleavened bread. They're not eating bitter herbs. Do you understand? They're not doing it in the evening. They did it after dark. You know, they left Egypt at dark. They did. They went out of there in the evening. They didn't do it early in the morning when they have mass. You see. And so all the things that you get wrong, we have been taught in the school that the things in the, in the law and the testimony, and that's in the law back there with Moses, they're pointing him out so you would know what it was. And really, it was pointing him out so you'd know that he was the one. And that's the point of everything. They don't know Jesus is the one, not for sure. Because they don't know what he did back through the law and the testimony. In fact, Jesus was never back there. There was never a man Jesus in the law and the testimony. But Yahshua was back there. You understand? And so anyway, I want to get back. I, I'm going off here a little bit. but <laughs> um, So anyway, here with the children of Israel, you have them taking out that Passover seat. And they're going to pass from a death-like state unto, a, uh, unto life. And they're going to go through that death. They have to take out and put that blood of the lamb on that door. So that's a death. And they have to go through the part of waters of the, of the Red Sea. You know why? That was the way that Yahweh set up the get out of darkness. And then they come through the part of waters of the Red Sea follow the, following the cloud. And they come up here in the wilderness to worship Yahweh, which is what he told Pharaoh. Let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. You understand? And so they come up. But the way that they came out of there was death, burial, resurrection. And that's pointing to Yahshua, the Messiah's death, burial, resurrection. And I know we hear these things all the time, but it's so important. It's so beautiful. It's so magnificent to be able to stay with the truth. In these dark days, in the darkness that's going on in the, in the you know, the IDMR in general, <laughs> it's just... It's just amazing that there's a few people that have held on to the truth. And any, anyway, 
so then it, it goes by the tabernacle pattern, which is right next door there. You got the blood on that altar. You got the burial with the labor, which your second speaker was talking about. So you've got death, you've got burial. You have resurrection with the holy anointing oil. That's what it was representing. And it was right there at the door that the holy anointing oil was poured upon the priest. See? And that signified him uh, ministering in the tabernacle. So that's a death and a burial and a resurrection. All right, so what you have is that was the way unto life. Because when you get up into your holy place, either in either one of these plates, let's just take the tabernacle first. Once you get into the holy place, you have sustenance. That's going to be the children. You know, that's what the priesthood did. They ate there. There was light in the tabernacle. And there was an intercession in the tabernacle. Well, we're supposed to be standing in the holy place. Let's get that verse, Matthew 24, uh, Matthew 24, start at 14. Thank you. Matthew 24 and 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Okay, when, now when when Dr. Kinley, if you ever, and I know you people, I know that people do, you listen to these tapes that we, and now we have some new tapes that are very clear, and they're great to listen to. So you, if you listen to the way the founder taught these things, and this was a verse that he used pretty consistently, and when he say things, uh, you know, in, even if you look at it transcribed, when he'd say, and this gospel of the kingdom, he'd say, and this gospel of the kingdom. The one that we preach in this school, <laughs> you understand? So it was, it was very important to him that he got across the gospel that was being taught in the school that he set up was the gospel of the kingdom. It was the self same gospel that Yahshua taught. You understand? Because he taught his apostles the, the gospel of the kingdom started to preach unto them the gospel, that he must go away and suffer many things and be, and be crucified and be buried three days and resurrect from the dead. Yahshua taught his disciples that before he went through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel of the kingdom, you understand? Because the kingdom can't come in until he goes through the death, burial, and resurrection. See, the kingdom of Yahshua can't be manifest. I mean, it, it was always in operation. But the kingdom of Satan is abolished when Yahshua gets up there on the cross and dies for the, to take away sin. See, and the kingdom of Yahshua is restored. And that's what's on your, one of your charts there. All right, so let's go, let's go to, oh, keep reading, sorry. <laughs> keep when, reading. Ye, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, now, when you therefore shall, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I know it's really hard to read for me, but I, I don't know how to teach any other way. So, so I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, you have, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet. Now the abomination of desolation in, in the other, in Mark, I think it says the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not. Well, it ought not to be standing in this school. You understand? So it's standing where it out not. And the abomination of desolation is that you've denied what Yahshua the Messiah did by taking away the old covenant and the old laws and that and having one nation with Israel, see, and bringing in a new covenant. And the abomination of desolation is when you just drag over the things from the old covenant to the new covenant. That's an abomination to Yahweh. He, he died for a reason. We're taking away the reason why he came in and died when you do that. People don't know the severity of their ignorance. You understand? It, it's a bad thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a terrible thing. All right. So anyway, keep reading, please, honey. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, uh -huh. stand in the holy place. So when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the mystery of iniquity and the abomination of that desolation... And the abomination that maketh desolate. That's what, that, you know, these, these abominations that make it def, desolate. You don't want to be in a desolate place. That's where we were when we were in the world. Desolate. No Holy Spirit. No hope. You know, nothing to look forward to. <laughs> anyway. No, nobody loves us. You know, you could go on and on. There, there could be quite a list of you. It took all of us and 
see the position that we were in in this world. It would have been a pretty bad list, I'd say. And so when you see that abomination of desolation, being desolate of the Holy Spirit, then you, once you see that, then you stand in the holy place because you've gone through that, you know, if, if you look at the way the pattern works, and this is the greater and more perfect pat pattern here with the children of Israel, the lamb died, they went through the part of waters of the Red Sea, they come up to worship Yahweh here at this mountain, they're going to stand in the holy place. And in the holy place in the migration, they, Yahweh gave them manna to eat. He was their sustenance. He gave them that manna, you understand? For 40 years, they didn't have to worry about what they had to eat. That'd be nice. Some of these people that have to go to these shelters and stuff now, that would be nice, you understand? We take for granted everything that we have and we never should. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But anyway, you have in the, in the holy place here in the migration of the children of Israel, that manna was given to them. So they had something to eat. He was their sustenance. There was always light. There was a fire, a pillar of a fire by night. So they were never in darkness. They had the sun in the daytime and that fire by night, never in darkness. And you know, one of the main things about darkness is people are afraid of the dark. There's, you, it's a, a fear like afraid. Okay. It's dark. You're afraid. And nobody likes to run around out there when it's really dark out. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> it, whether you're in the city or in the country, <laughs> you understand? Anyway, it, it's just one of those things that that's part of it. And it, Yahweh, when he takes away darkness, he takes away darkness. And we no longer have those things that once we feared fear of death and fear of, you know, how somebody thought about you and thought, you know, all kinds of just little fears and big fears that we had. Yahshua has taken away the fear out of our hearts because we know that we have a savior. We know that he loves us. We have a pattern to go by and we know that he's the light of the world. We know that he's lit up our world's spiritually so and that we can see things and we see why he's done the things that he's done you understand and, and that, that it's just great and then we also in there you have the intercessor and back here with the children of Israel was Moses Moses went to the tent and he talked to Yahshua and then Moses would go and talk to the people and then Moses would go and talk to Yahshua and then Moses would go and talk to the people and whatever Yahshua said then Moses would tell the people you understand well, the, the mediator after Yahshua goes through death, his death, burial, and resurrection is the Holy Spirit. See, and that Holy Spirit intercedes to the Father for us. See, he's the, he's the only intercessor now. He's the only mediator. The Holy Spirit, the same one that said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only intercessor or mediator between Yahweh and man. Do you get that word only in there? You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to your, your dean. You don't have to get, you understand? He's the intercessor and he's given us his great spirit. And that's where you go. You ask Yahshua for anything. And you know, we ask him, we ask. And we, you, you know, as you grow in this teaching, you know, you know what to ask for because you see his righteousness. You see what he thinks is right. And those are the things that you ask for. You don't go asking for, oh, I'd like a Cadillac or I'd like, a, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. And neither are you, I know. But you do have Yahshua as your intercessor. You know, please, Yahshua, I can't take anymore. <laughs> or <laughs> please, Yahshua, I don't want this cold. <laughs> or, you know, you know how you talk to Yahshua. Anyway. It's it's a great thing to have an intercessor like he is, so connected to us. He's he's sitting on his throne in us, in the soul, guiding us and being our savior. It's it's just wonderful, wonderful. This is a wonderful teaching. The things that you can learn and the things that you realize that you have been translated into a kingdom where he is the king, and he's reigning in this kingdom of ours. And even though the world is going on around us and it's so chaotic and all the things that are happening and people pitting against other people because of every 
reason under the sun. And whenever you see anything where you see there's a division between people, no matter what it is, if it's politics, if it's race, if it's anything that you see, you got to know who's doing that. That's the mystery of iniquity. He's the one that gets in there to divide, not Yahshua. Yahshua's gathered us up to, to bring us all together into one body or unify people. You understand? He's not getting in there to divide you. So that's something you probably ought to just say, well, that's not for me. You understand? I'm, <laughs> no matter what. Anyway, that's a... Okay, I went there. <laughs> All right, let's go to, um, was I still reading? I'm sorry, read that whole verse again. Uh, okay. Stand in the holy place. So we're going to be no. standing in the holy place. Would you go back to the, um, uh, uh, oh my goodness, elementary chart, please? 15th verse. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Okay, so we'd be standing in the holy place, see? And there you have, if you look at the tabernacle, you also have that lampstand, that's the light. You have the showbread, that's the sustenance. And you have the altar of incense, that's where the priest offered up his prayers unto Yahweh. All right, and you have the high priest, Yahshua, in us now, being the Holy Spirit, offering up prayers unto Yahweh, or being the intercessor, Okay. All right, so anyway, getting back to the way, I want to look at the word way, and you can look it up in a dictionary, but a way is a passage from one place to another. It's a road, a path, or a highway. And so I was thinking when I read this that it was, it was going to be a way. I was thinking about John 14 and 6 for one thing, but you have the way into the most holy, or yeah, the way into the most holy place, which is where Yahweh dwells, is also a, a death, death on the altar, burial and resurrection. So you always have that particular pattern of the way that you have to go to get into the holy place and most holy place, or sometimes you call the most holy place is heaven and everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to go the way to get there you understand they don't want to go Yahweh's way so <laughs> anyway so you have um in the plate at the bottom you have Yahshua's death and burial and resurrection and that's the way that heaven was opened up if you look at the plates the way they're painted on this chart you have Yahshua's death burial resurrection ascension and as soon as Joshua dies, raises, and ascends, then the Holy Spirit is poured out. That's your Pentecost plate, all right? That's the Holy Spirit being poured out. So then heaven is opened up. You see that across there? Heaven is open, heaven is open, heaven is open, heaven is open. Mm -hmm. And then you have on the, the one, two, three, four, the fifth one, the way, the truth, and the life, you have Joshua the Messiah sitting on his throne there and showing that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And the things that are by the wayside, you know, and you can look, even think about the word, the wayside, something that's out of the way. That's these, well, on one side, you have uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the hierarchy there. And on the other side, you have the later day, um, later day, I can't read a lot of it right now, but apostate church, the latter day, sex, cults, and creeds, and all the things, false science, theoretical opinions, religious merchants, Satan's ministers, see? And you have Babylon being down here in the court roundabout, and you have that question mark there, and that unrighteous bird, that's not, the, that's not a representing, you see you have the dove representing the Holy Spirit, you have this guy representing the unholy spirit, or the spirit of the mystery of iniquity. And he's restoring carnal ordinances, and that's that apostate church. But right in the middle of all this going on, you got the way, the truth, and the life. And that's where we are. We're in that little strip of everything that's going on and looking at yeah, looking to Yahshua, our Savior, as being the way, the truth, and the life. And so he had, he, he's that way, that, that, you know, that way. Let's get John 17. Start right at one, please. John 17 and one. These words make Yahshua. And lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Uh -huh. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, 
that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Uh huh. And this is life eternal. Now this, this is, is what Yahshua says. This is what life eternal is. Read. That they might know thee. The only true Elohim. And Yahshua the Messiah. Whom thou hast sent. See the, this is what he said. And this is life eternal. The only true Yahweh. Elohim. And Yahshua the Messiah whom thou hast sent. He's the only true one. And if you look at the way, let's go to the, I, I hate to have you moving around these charts, but I go back to the Moses chart for a minute. Thank you. See, if you look at the way that Moses sees the creation, Yahweh Elohim is Yahweh pure spirit. And he takes on a super incorporeal shape and form and he creates the creation according to the pattern. He is that pattern. See, you I forgot what I was going to say. Why I forgot why I wanted to go there. Oh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> so you have, oh, I know why. Okay, I remember now. So anyway, you have, he says that he's the only true Elohim. Isn't that right? He's the yeah. archetype original pattern. He's the only one. Now, if you look at the way Yahweh comes into a shape and a form, and if you can think about the 40 plate chart, You've got a, a picture of Yahweh Elohim in the first plate. And then you have theosophy, which is the setting forth of all things. And it's those attributes and a set position coming into shape and form. All right. So you have him coming into shape and form. That's the only true Elohim. That's how everything came in. Now that ought to give you an idea of how we're going back. You understand? Because if everything comes in in him and he declares the end from the beginning, then the way we're going to go back is through Yahshua the Messiah. You came in in Yahshua and it's going to go back in Yahshua. He's the only true Elohim. You understand? And, and if you think about the way that he, when he comes into shape and form and he shows Moses in this vision that he gives to Moses, he shows him according to the tabernacle pattern. He shows Moses that everything is within that cloud or within him. You understand? And I was reading a transcript and I'm not saying I totally understand this, but Dr. Kinley was talking how the, the cloud emanates from Elohim. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I'm still thinking on that one because, it, 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 you know, there's, there's a lot of things to learn in the school. And there's a lot of things that, he, that, you know, some of us know and some of us don't know and some of us understand, some of us don't. But, you know, whatever it is that you understand, if it came from Yahshua and it's true, it's enough. Because the knowledge of Yahshua is that spirit. Just like the power of the gospel is that spirit of Yahshua. It's that spirit of Yahweh that made everything. And that spirit, once it's in you, it seals you up into the kingdom. You're sealed. It's not going to go anyplace. You're going to be in him. And yes, we're going to grow and we're going to keep on learning in ages yet to come, which tells you, we, you know, we think we, we haven't made no and stuff, but there's so much, you know, if you keep, and I have this testimony, I've been in class for a, since I was, I'm, since I was a young person, a long, long time, since 1973, that's a few years ago. So, Every time I come to class, every time, and I never remember any deviation from this, I've learned something. And that's something. Now, if you can go and learn something every single time you go to class, three times a week, and lately I, I go to class every day now, see, because I have this great Zoom that I can just flit around on. But if you, if you recognize that you can learn something every time you come to class, Think of how much there is to learn. Think of how much there, you know, Yahweh's so big. We have a little, and you know, Justin talked about if you ever have a, a not whole view, well, that's what we have. We just have this little view and it's, I know it's all encompassing because it was a vision given to Dr. Kidley right from the creator, 
but that's just the part that he wants us to see right now. There's so much more to Yahweh than the just the view that we have. <laughs> I don't know. I hope somebody's followed me along. You know, I, like I said before, I, it's so hard on these things because nobody says anything. You're like, you know what I mean? I say, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, at least for laughing. Okay. So um, anyway, uh, the you know he's the only true elephant if you go back to that 17th chapter and it's something that we get all the time john 17 and 3 but he's the only one that's where we came from that's where we're going to go back to because he is a unity see and that's another thing that you know he's this great unity so let me go to um let's go to the word find <laughs> because um that's part of the definition of way and I just want to let you know this. This is something I found out, you know, a few years ago. But the first aim, our first aim of the school is to help you to find and know Yahweh as he really is and as he actually exists. And so I look, you know, from time to time we do things five like minutes. that. We look up the. Five the, minutes. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, you look up something like, uh, like the word find or the things that are in the. Um, you know, the uh, aims. And uh, I looked up the word find and the etymology of the word find is to set on a path. So when he helps us to find, to help you find and know Yahweh, he's giving you the way to go. He's setting you on a path. And look how we do that over and over. And it's such a repetition. Go to the law and the testimony, um, you know, see that Yahshua's fulfilling the law and the prophets, go back to the you know, the, the invisible things are pointed out by the visible things. All these things are the way that he set up that we would get to know him. You understand? All right, let's get me two verses. Amos 5 and 4 and Luke 11, 9 and 10. Amos. Five. Oh, my gosh. It's almost 9 o'clock. I can't believe it. Okay. Amos 5 and 4. Mm -hmm. For thus saith Yahweh unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. See, seek ye me, and you shall live. And that's our first aim. See, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And we want to seek him. And you know, there's another verse. Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You understand? And so he's saying, seek me and live because he is the life. He's the way, he's the truth, he's life. So if you seek Yahweh, that's going to cause you to live, you understand, if you find him. And you can find him if you want to, <laughs> you understand, which is what we've done. All right. Get me Luke 11, 9 and 10. And then I want to get the scripture. Yep, read. And I say unto you, ask. And it shall be given you. Now just ask. This is what Yahshua said unto the apostles. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Read on. Seek, and you shall find. Seek, and you shall find. See? Read. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. See? Read. For everyone that asketh, receive it. Uh-huh. And he that seeketh, findeth. Yep. So he used and to, and that to knock it, it shall be open. And if you knock, and you know in Revelation it says, Behold, I see he stand at the door and knock. If any man open, I will come in and I'll sup with him. And he would mean that's the reality of the Passover. He's going to come in, he's going to sup with you and you with him. <laughs> see? All right, give me um, Isaiah 61 1. <clears throat> The spirit of Yahweh, no, excuse me, the spirit of Yah Yahweh is upon me. Uh -huh. because Yahweh hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. So he, Yahweh was on the, the spirit of Yahweh was on the prophet back there to preach good tidings. Good tidings is the gospel. That's another another way to put the gospel. It's the good news of the kingdom of Yahshua. And the spirit was on him to preach the gospel or preach the good tidings of the kingdom. Read. He has sent me to, 
Thank you. He I'm has sorry. sent me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Okay, would you read that again? I'll interrupt you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, read. The spirit of Yah Yahweh is upon me because uh -huh. Yahweh hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. So he if you're anointed, this is what you're anointed for. If you're a minister in this teaching, which if you have the Holy Spirit, that's what you become, a, a ministering spirit, see? It's not just for us to have and keep and keep under a basket. It's for us to tell the rest of anybody that will hear this. Because if, if somebody hadn't come to us, we wouldn't know it. And we should keep that in mind. You understand? Somebody took the time to come to us with this. Go ahead and read, please. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To he sent proclaim. me to bind. Bind up the brokenhearted, and that's what you're going to be doing, see? Because you're going to show them who Yahshua is. And he's the one that binds up the brokenhearted. Go ahead and read. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Uh-huh. You can be free of the mystery of iniquity. Read. And the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. Yep. You can get up out of that darkness and out of Egypt and you can be in Yahshua's light and be fed with his principles. You understand? You can be in the light of Yahshua, the Messiah, and you can have him interceding to the father for you with that Holy Spirit in you, which is our hope. You know, it's our earnest of our expectation right now of our inheritance having the Holy Spirit. So with those few words of encouragement, I hope somebody got something out of it. Thank you very much for having us. And I have really enjoyed the speakers from your side too. And it's lovely, lovely to be here. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Bonnie Schneider. Well, that concludes class for today. Um, I wanna thank all our visiting brethren from Art Court, New York. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Schneider in class. We really love you guys and we thank you for coming us coming to our study with us. Did we have any announcements? All right. Well we'll we'll close out this session with doxology. Doxology is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude and goes as follows. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and all time. Let us all say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I enjoy class.